I like to do things, I like to, you know, take a certain approach because I believe that it's going to solve some set of problems and not just sort of randomly do things because I think it sounds fun. So I like to, you know, what is the problem that a distributed team is trying to solve? Like, why would you go down this road? Um, does anybody have any ideas why, like, what is the problem that a distributed team is trying to solve? <coughs> Tim? Um, I guess if you have one of, uh, one of these a couple of levels, like, why are, are you asking why would a team be distributed? No, why would, why would an organization say, I want to build a distributed team? Because I think it's a greater workforce. Okay. So, so a larger pool of talent to pull from. Sarah? Really? They're also taking pre-existing teams from different sections of the company and getting one person from each group to form some sort of cross-functional team to solve a specific problem. Okay, so like the, so it sounds like what you're saying, just to reiterate so make sure I understand. Um, by taking these people that are sort of geographically distributed, you can create a team that is sort of cross-functional in order to uh, sort of tackle some sort of problem. The Tiger Team, I think, is something that's bandied about these days a lot, um, which is, by the way, one of my least favorite phrases in the universe. Um, <laughs> I didn't say it. <laughs> I know. It's fine. So, um, I think those are both valid. I think, I, I, my assertion is that the problem, the primary problem that distributed teams solve, is a lack of choice. And it's from the perspective of the employer and the employee. Um, so from the employer problem, like Tim said, it's really hard to get really good talent. Um, Rick, uh, we, when we were at Cheeseburger, uh, we doubled the size of the team in like a year. And it was incredibly time consuming to find the people and source them and interview them and go through all the hundreds of resumes. Um, it's really hard to find good people. And if you can expand the pool from which you're drawing, you just have that many more, it's a numbers game. Like the more resumes you can filter through, you know, if you're sourcing in the right places, the more chances you are, you have of finding that diamond in the rough. Um, and it could also be a geographic thing, like the local talent pool could be limited. If you have a great idea for a company or a startup and you're in the middle of, you know, Montana or something, you might just not have the people local to you. That's not really the problem this group has, but that is, you know, something that could be Another problem this group does have is that the local talent pool here is very expensive. You have Amazon, you have Microsoft, you have all these giant companies that just throw money at people that are talented, and you have to compete with that. Um, and so, you know, if you can get a bargain on your employees, I'm not saying to underpay your employees, but you have less competition. Um, so you're talking local outsourcing? Kind of. Like outsourcing within the, you know, wherever. Um, so that's the perspective from the employer. What about for the employee? What problems does it solve? Well, the same, that same guy that has a startup you know, in Montana, what if you're an engineer in Montana? You don't want to work for companies in Montana because there's just not that many great ones to work for. Um, I keep picking on Montana only because I have a friend in my camp, Montana that I used to work for, and so it just always pops in my head whenever I'm talking about these places. I've never actually been to Montana, so if you're <laughs> from there, I apologize. I'm just being a terrible person right now. Um, so you, the local companies might suck. You might not want to work for, you know, wherever. Or, you know, less Montana and more local if you don't want to work in rural Seattle or Tacoma. Like, all that's available there is government jobs and, um, you know, stuff like that. If you don't want to work there and you want to work something a little more challenging, you have options. Um, and sometimes it's simply that your lifestyle is incompatible with your chosen career. This is really interesting, we're going to talk a little bit more about this later. But most of the time you have to choose your career about the time you're 18, but you don't really figure out what your lifestyle is going to be probably until you're in your late 20s or 30s. And so by the time that you've chosen a career, you might end up with a lifestyle that makes your career very difficult to move forward with. Um, so that's my assertion of what pro the problem is is trying to solve. Uh, I'm sure other people have uh, different ideas about what problem distributed teams solve. But this is just my take on the situation. So if we're going from the problem now into the benefits. What's to like about distributed teams? Um, so if the problem that we're solving, or if the problem that we're trying to solve is a lack of choices, 
we would hope that distributed teams would give us more, more choices. Um, and just like Tim said, the talent pool, as you sort of expand the area in which you're searching, grows bigger and bigger. I strongly believe, and you know, people may disagree with me, but I strongly believe that the last team that I was involved in building at Cheeseburger could not have been of the caliber that it was without having been able to recruit from a nationwide pool of talent. Um, and if you just think about it, like the number of developers here in Seattle, if you wanted to have a completely co-located team, um, is, is you know, a certain amount. I, I don't know what it would be like, but I feel like every time you sort of expand, you know, so what if I only include people from Washington State? What if I only include people from the US? You sort of have an order of magnitude, roughly, I would guess, of more people to sort of sift through. Uh, Tim had a question in the back. What was that? I was wondering if you were uh, saying you believe that it could have been that caliber without expanding the, um, the region that you're looking at, uh, based on simply, you know, were there people that could have any, any way been hired? Uh, I don't believe that we could have, I don't believe, that's a good question. I don't believe, it's not that those people in Seattle aren't amazing. I mean, Seattle has an amazing developer community, but this amazing developer community is also very well employed. It would have been very much more expensive, very much more time consuming to find these people. Um, and, and that's what I mean when I say we couldn't have built a team of that caliber. Um, the team we built at Cheeseburger was quite amazing. Um, but. It's sort of interesting, as you move outside of these runs, like, okay, what does my company start to look at if, as I start moving outside, you know, from ring to the next? If all of my developers, if I say, okay, well, I'll, I'm okay with remote people, but only in Washington. Well, then you can probably have them in the office pretty regularly. Um, and, you know, if you, if you need that high bandwidth face-to-face -face communication, you can just bring them in. I mean, they're, like, from here to the Tri-Cities, it's like four hours. It's not that big of a deal. I think it's four hours. Is that about right? Once you get into the United States, though, like you say, okay, well, I'm okay with the remote force as long as they're in the U.S. Okay, well, you can still have them into the office, but it's kind of an ordeal sometimes. Um, you have to start dealing with different states' income taxes, and sort of there's a little bit more overhead associated with that. Um, and similarly, if you say, like, okay, well, the entire world is my oyster. Um, lots of crazy legal stuff you have to start dealing with. Um, so there's sort of a, a balancing act you have to play, like how big of a talent pool do I want to start looking into? And you can look at it from the other perspective as well. Um, if I am an engineer in, in Montana, um, I can look at the local number of the local companies and say, okay, well here's the people I have to sort of deal with. You know, I can start looking at in-state, knowing that you know my lifestyle is going to be of to go into the office relatively regularly. Um, not have to, but it's likely I'll have to go into the office relatively regularly. Um, but you know, otherwise things are pretty simple. In country, um, you might have to do some flying, you might have some week-long trips. Uh, the world, I have no idea. Um, choices, if employers have more potential people to hire, and if employees have more, you know, choices to choose from, and, you know, I don't have a whole lot of data to support this, but I feel like that would mean that, there, that you could have for better matches between employers and employees. If I have more choices, I'm more likely to pick something that I'm passionate about. If I'm you know, hiring someone and I have more choices, I, I'm going to pick someone that's better. I'm not going to, like, say, oh, well, these people suck, so I'm going to hire them because they're remote. You, it's just a numbers game at that point. Like, you can have better matches between employers and employees. You can, you can have employees that are passionate about what you're doing. And having passionate employees is really, really valuable. Um, you have the potential for a higher caliber team. Now, this doesn't guarantee that you're going to have a higher, higher caliber team because you still have to be able to recruit those people. You have to have employer branding that makes high caliber people actually want to work for you. Um, As, an, as like I said, as an employee, you have the opportunity to work for better companies doing something that you love. If you can, you know, make your net as wide as possible and happen to find something that you really are passionate about or interested in, then you can be a part of that. Um, 
And like I said, you know, you can find passion. You can find employees that are passionate about what you do. And then there's sort of the employee satisfaction side of the coin. Um, if you give people a job that they, that's a really great sort of fit for them, they're going to be really passionate about doing their best and keeping that job. Um, and so in that vein, I want to show you what I looked at every day as while I was a director of engineering at Chief Burr. You can't really see it up here, but this was the view from my back deck. As I was living in southwest Washington in a forest, basically, looking over a tidal flat that went up and down with the tides every day. And that was amazing. I was, I was in a sort of management position, so that's another thing that I want to take this moment to talk about is that things that you might think might restrict, um, you know, like the type of role that you're in, like you definitely should consider what kind of role you can perform as a remote employee, but it might be a wider sort of net than what you think. Um, I was in a managerial role. This is where I lived, um, and it was amazing. And I was I put in my heart and soul into that team um, because I wanted to maintain that. Uh, one of our developers got married and took a long honeymoon and sort of just you know he had his honeymoon and then they stayed for like an extra two weeks or something like that. And this was his view out of his room in Hawaii um, where he was working from. Um, just having that flexibility. I mean. What kind of huge perk is that, like, in your compensation package when you say, oh, well, you know, every once in a while, if you want to work from here, why not? <laughs> we had an, an engineer that um, worked out of his RV. He just lived and traveled around the country and would go and live at a place for a couple weeks. And uh, he's my favorite story to tell. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was, that was his life. He still does. He still does, yes. He's life stuff, right? um, and he's a phenomenal developer and any company would be lucky to have them. Um, there's another interesting thing, as I, as I started uh, sort of talking to more people about this, there's sometimes remote work is the only option a person has. And this, I, I was really sort of interested in this when I started digging into it more. Um, I, I, there's, there's a category I like to call spouse lock-in. Um, and, and it all boils down to, if you have to choose between your career and love, you're gonna pick love every time. Um, and so, for instance, military spouses. I was talking to a Navy wife, and uh, she worked remotely. She was a project manager for a software company in Seattle. And um, the only way that she can have a career is to work remotely because she has to move every two or three years. And so, you know, she's very good at what she does. She's, you know, very well respected by the people that she works with. And um, the only way that she could have this career and not just sort of have to, you know, change jobs every two years or so is to work remotely. Um, she has the support of her company. She comes in you know, when she needs to have that face time. But I thought that was really cool. Um, it, it's sort of, this is, a, this is a way to sort of enable people that classically could not have had careers to actually have careers. Um, if your spouse is in school, especially med school, you don't have a whole lot of choice about where you live as you go through the medical school process. Um, so if you can work remotely, then you can to advance your career during that time period. Um, like I said, love is a powerful motivator. And then distributed remote working in general, not just distributed, it was great for new parents. Um, sort of the ability to work from home and you know have different hours maybe than you might strictly need to, but being able to sort of try to do it all. It sounds exhausting, honestly. <laughs> but, um, but I've seen it work several times. Um, there are other benefits as well. Uh, you have better control over your home office environment, you know, ergonomics, that fun stuff. Um, and it's been my experience that remote employees tend to work more. I think it's like you're, you're at home and you feel like, oh, I've got to get this stuff done. I'm at home and like there's just sort of this guilt. I don't, I don't, I don't know what it is, but there's there's this like <laughs> kind of like almost anxiety, like I've got to do all this stuff because I'm at home and I really need to work. And, um, and I say this from my own experience. Like when I lived out in the forest, like I did not work normal hours. I worked more than I strictly needed to. Um, and that's that's something I think that over time you learn to you learn the skill of like balancing that for yourself. But um, I'm not saying you should go like hire a bunch of remote employees and have them work 80 hours a week. That's not <laughs> what I'm saying. Um, for some people, it can be really difficult to focus in an office environment. Um, 
uh, as a software engineer, like flow is super critical, like being able to get into a problem and just stay inside of it for hours at a time. Um, and I'm, I, I'm sure you know how easy it is to have that broken and to lose that and to sort of come back and try to put together the pieces of where you were. Um, almost every person I've talked to, when I say, you know, what is one of the benefits of working from home? And they're just like, focus. I can focus on stuff. I can get inside of it and I can get stuff done. <coughs> So that's, those are some of the benefits um, of distributed uh, development or distributed teams. Um, there are sucky parts, uh, and, but there's there's one thing I, I, I use animation precisely once, I believe, in this in this thing, and it's coming up. Um, there's lots of incredibly frustrating problems associated with remote development. I do not in any way believe that it's this magical unicorn that's going to come solve all your problems and it's just going to be super easy. It's really hard and it takes a lot of work. Um, so we're getting to that part. Um, there's a lot of like, incredibly frustrating problems with it, but productivity loss is not one of them. Like, a lot of people have this, and I think, I think it's like some kind of Western business culture thing where the only way that you can work is between the hours of 9 to 5 sitting at your computer and if you're doing anything else, you're not being productive or adding value to the company. Um, which isn't true at all, and we keep seeing study, and study after study sort of showing that like that's not how you get stuff done, and um, but it just sort of remains in the common knowledge. Um, <clears throat> communication obviously is much more difficult in a distributed team. Um, you lose body language. Uh, body language is huge. Um, some people are better at reading it than others, but. You just have tone over voice, and tone is even harder to read without the body language. So that's it's just difficult. And there's this whole, and I didn't really realize how important it was until I didn't have it anymore. And then, like, I started realizing that I just I don't always know what's happening because I can't see their bodies. Um, technical difficulties, um, sort of. <laughs> I laugh. I, I laugh. Um, at Scott's expense, the, uh, there, was, there was an infamous, infamous moment where we couldn't get Skype to do what we wanted. And Scott slammed down the laptop and walked right out of the room. It was part of the cheese lore. But um, it can be super duper frustrating when you're trying to talk to someone, when you're trying to get something done and Skype's not cooperating or the Wi-Fi network isn't working. Or it, It's really interesting how you know, it took 100 years for the telephone network to become as amazingly rock like steady, stable as it is right now. And I didn't really appreciate how amazing of an achievement the phone system was until I tried to use something else for talking to people. <laughs> um, drawing can be difficult. There's not a great, I've yet to find, and if you ever find anything like that makes this amazingly easy, please tell me about it. Um, because I'm a very visual communicator. I like to draw on the dry erase boards. And there's just not a great solution out there for drawing and explaining or like drawing while you're explaining to someone. And me personally, that was like a huge deal, like not being able to draw. Um, scheduling is a pain, time zones are super frustrating. You would think as a software engineer, I would be able to add and subtract one from a number, but I cannot. Um, there can be a lack of tone in text. Um, it's really easy to misread an email, to misread an IM and to think, you know, that they're being super rude when in fact they're making a joke or whatever. And there's just the where is she kind of thing. Like, it's, it's, you can't just walk up to someone's desk and sort of see if they're there or not. Um, so sometimes it just seems like people disappear. Um, I feel like that happens just as often in an office. Like, I feel like there's been many a time where I'm just wandering around the office looking for someone, but for some reason virtually it feels more annoying. Um, for a distributed team, there's also trust issues. Um, it's hard to build trust when the person that you're talking to is just a little blip on your screen in your chat room. Um, it's easy to lose trust when the person that you're talking to isn't a human with a face, but a, an IM message that pops up right in the middle when you're trying to do stuff. Um, and I, and I strongly believe that trust decays without the space-to-face -face interaction, um, which leads me to my next slide, which is the half-life of trust. And I stole this from someone, I don't know who, and it was years ago, and fortunately I don't know who came up with this idea. But the idea is that when you're in a room with someone, 
and you're looking at them in the face, you're building a certain type of trust with them. That's sort of, you're building a relationship with them and you're building trust. And as you sort of go your separate ways and you don't see them face to face, you're still on the phone, you know, you might still be chatting with them, but that face to face relationship, that trust that you've built by being in the same room and working on things together starts to erode. And like about, you know, six months since you've seen the person last, you have about half as much trust. I mean, it's a rule of thumb, hardly measurable. But just the idea that you, you still need, even in a distributed environment, you still need to get together and see each other's faces. Um, it's something very human. I don't know how it all works. Um, but it is very real. Um, there's another thing for distributed employees, the alternate reality syndrome. People, I don't know what it is exactly, but if you give people like half the story, we're very, very good at filling in the holes of the things that we don't know. And so it's very, very common for, you know, if, if they hear like, you know, one thing, they'll create the rest of it. And the, the pieces that they create are often the worst possible scenario. <laughs> um, and so it's something you have to be very, very cautious of, um, both from, you know, if you're, if you're in the office or if you're remote, knowing that, you know, the remote people might create a version of events just based on, you know, whatever it's based on. It's very much not based in reality. Um, and it's just something to be aware of that it's going to happen and just handle it as it does. Uh, some other difficulties. Um, collaboration is slightly more difficult. It's not as, it's not as difficult as you would first imagine. <laughs> it's a learned skill, though. It takes time to sort of learn how to collaborate with people in a virtual environment. Um, again, time zones are annoying. I mean, we're incredibly isolating working from home. Um, I mean, you can go for days without leaving the house. I know I have. Um, if you live alone, it's even worse. Um, if, if your spouse works from home as well, I don't know. I haven't been in that situation, but it, I, I, it might be difficult for me. Um, separation of home, of work and home life is difficult. Um, when your office is like, you know, the room next to your bedroom, or you know, if you have a small apartment, when your office is your bedroom, um, sort of just having that, you know, at the end of the day, if you live, work in the office, you get in your car and you drive home, and you sort of have that time to decompress and switch gears. That's gone. Like at the end of the day, you close your laptop, and you're suddenly supposed to be at home, and it, it can be really difficult. And it's harder to physically hit someone when you really, really want to when they're distributed. Um, and you're going to really want to sometimes. Um, and so those are sort of the high-level overview you know, pros and cons about things that work and things that don't. Um, and so I want to switch gears into a little bit more practical. Like, you know, okay, let's, you know, ignoring all that, let's say you're going for a distributed team or, you know, maybe you're in that situation where you have one engineer that is remote um, because it just, it just tends to happen um, these days and there's nothing wrong with that. I think it's fine. Um, but what are some of the things that you can do to make it work? Um, and before we go in, like I think I've already said this, but there are no silver bullet answers. What it is, is it takes a lot of work and dedication and, um, you know, it's a lot of work to make this stuff work. And it's a lot of work to make an in-office team work, so um, none of it's easy. Um, it's really important that your organization and culture support remote work. Um, when I was talking to people, sort of interviewing them and talking to them and stuff, the thing that I kept hearing was, you know, my company is really supportive when I need to do X. Um, and if you, and if your company is not going to be supportive, if they're going to make it really difficult, if you want to come into the office and like, okay, well, here's this 12 forms you need to fill out to get authorization for X, Y, and Z, it's not going to work out for you. Um, it's going to end poorly. Um, your, your culture and your company has to really be invested in making this a success. Um, you need to pay close attention to the interfaces for friction. That's sort of a really big statement, but I tried to word it in several different ways. And what I mean by that is if you have part of your company that's remote, and you have part of your company that's in office, those companies are going to have divergent cultures. And that is going to cause problems. Um, so pay close attention to those interfaces. 
and work towards trying to smooth those relationships. There came a point in my career in which I stopped describing what I did in terms of the code that I wrote or the things that I built and in terms of the relationships that I maintained and um, the relationships that I built and the relationships that I maintained. Um, you need someone sort of paying attention to the relationships that are being built inside your team towards other departments if, they're local, if there's like a cross between local and remote. Um, and you also need someone paying attention to the relationships that are being built inside your team. Um, and you need to have a huge focus on inclusion. Nothing feels crappier than your office having an in-office, you know, it's May birthday day, yay, let's have a cake. Oh, all your remote people? Eh, screw off, nothing for you. Like, that just makes you feel bad. Um, <laughs> Um, so you have to have a huge focus on including people all the time. Um, and that just, it requires sort of a constant effort. Were you the in case? You think? Were you the case in case? <laughs> you oh, <laughs> well, and, and I talk about this a little bit later, but there's different ways that you can celebrate. I mean, if you're having cake in the office, like, buy your team a copy of Team Fortress 2 and just say, hey, let's all go play a game. Um, it's really satisfying to shoot your boss in the head. <laughs> Are you going to share slides? Uh, yeah, I can share the slides. Uh, I think uh, we talked about that, I believe. The slides. Well, yes. I care. Well, we're taping them now, and then we'll put them up on the site as well. Um, so you have to have a focus on inclusion. Um, at the end of the day, your, your organization isn't the office that it's in. It's not the servers. It's the people. And it's the people that are going to make your distributed team work for um, being a remote employee requires a certain skill set. Uh, you, you have to have you know, good communication skills, good teamwork skills, good transparency skills. And if you'll notice, those are the same skills that you want from an in-office employee. Um, it's really interesting. A good in-office employee will make a good remote employee. A mediocre in-office employee will make an absolutely disastrous remote employee because you just won't know what's going on. It's just this silent black hole, and it's not good. Um, and so, you know, hire for, if that's what you want, hire for that skill set. Don't hire people that have poor communication skills. They might be technical rock stars, but don't hire them if they can't communicate. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and the, I titled the talk Distributed Agile whatever I titled it, I can't remember. And um, once I started putting together a deck, I realized that most of, that I had very little to say about Agile, actually. Um, <laughs> and, it's, and it's because it's not very different. The, the Agile philosophies and the Lean philosophies that sort of ground it and you know, build everything, just let them guide you towards how to do this. You still do your stand-ups, you still do your estimations, you still do your retrospective. You just do them in a slightly different way. Um, you leverage collaboration tools, you know, just let the values guide you. You know what you need to do. If you're familiar with Agile and you know how to do it, you know what you need to do. You just have to do it, and you have to do it in a slightly different way. And you have to figure that out. Like, every team has to figure out, like, well, I strongly believe that a development process has to be uniquely tailored to the team that, it's, that is using it. Um, if you have like a cookie cutter process and you try to just implement it on top of people without understanding their individuals with you know certain skills and certain needs, then it's just not going to work. Um, and so you just have to do that same thing with a distributed team. Um, but I didn't want to. After putting it in the title, I felt really bad about just ignoring it completely. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the way that we did retrospectives. <laughs> So this is an example. So if you haven't used Google Docs with like six people at the same time, where you have like six people in the same document collaborating on trying to build something, then I strongly suggest you do it, even if you don't have a distributed team, because it's an amazing tool. Just having a place where six people can go and write and have ideas and move them around and sort of understand and like communicate that way, it's a really fantastic thing. It's something that I absolutely love. Um, so I just wanted to walk through this to give you an idea of like what a retrospective might look like if everybody's virtual. So the idea is that you're all on Skype or Vint or whatever your audio, you know, Google Hangout. Um, maybe you have videos going on. Um, 
And so, you know, you used to have this document that's sort of this running tally of, you know, what this retrospective is. So, you know, you might take a look at your previous retrospective action, action items and say, like, well, did we accomplish those things that we said we were going to accomplish? Um, <clears throat> and just mark those. You want to call that stuff out. You don't want to let, you know, things that you say you're going to do not get done and just get swept under the rug. Um, and then, you know, I, I don't know if the, the Diana Larson and Esther someone um, retrospectives book, the Agile retrospectives book, um, there's a whole bunch of exercises in there. Uh, some of them are more adaptable to sort of virtual formats than others, but you really just have to sort of play with it and see what happens. The MadSec lab exercise works really well. Excuse me. Um, so, you know, you might just have MadSec lab, and since it's a Google Doc, everybody can just go in there and type all the stuff, type all the things they're mad about and all the things they're glad about, and dump it all in there. You can do dot voting. How do you do dot voting? You put dots on it. Um, and so, you know, Anne gave me shit about one of my tests, not having a single assertion. You know, she sent me this snarky email. Um, and so you go through those, you vote the things you want to talk about, and then you sort of talk about it in the notes section. You know, Anne was just kidding. Like, the tone came across wrong in email, and it's really easy, and we all understand how easy it is to get tone wrong in an email. And so it was no big deal. She apologized. It was all happy. You know, why did the planet fail? And all kinds of reasons. Probably the weather. Um, but anyway, so the action items out of this, out of this retrospective, you know, follow up with a root cause analysis for the deployment failure. That's a whole separate conversation. Let's look into that. Um, and carryover, um, just something that we didn't do last time around. Uh, and in this document, you know, you just have the same document. And you just, you know, this is the previous, at the very bottom, this you know, the previous retrospective, beginning of those notes. I couldn't put it all in there, obviously. Um, you just keep adding to the top, and that way you have this perfect log of all of your retrospectives and all the action items and all the things that you said you were going to do and all the things that you said you were going to do and didn't do. Um, and it's all right there, and it's all amazingly simple to manage. Um, and if you want to talk more about sort of the nitty gritty of how this works or whatever, I mean, feel free to come to me after. I'd be happy to talk about it more. Um, but I want to move on. I'm kind of running out of time. <clears throat> and there's, I, I put this at the end of the how-to section because it's absolutely the most critical thing, and it goes back to the half-life of trust. Um, and that's, you have to have that face time, no matter where your people are, if they're in, you know, Tacoma or if they're in Poland, bring them into the office several times a year. Um, yes, is that expensive? Yes. But, you know, just factor that into their compensation package. Like, if, it's your remote employee, like we know we're gonna have to do this, so just do your budget right. Um, because it is so important, it's so critical to build that, build those relationships and have that time together. And have that time together to work, and also have that time together to, the, the primary focus of this time, like if you bring everybody in for two days or a week or whatever you can manage, the primary focus of that time is to build relationships. And that is so critical. It's not to, you know, we have this week together where we're going to try to bang out as much stuff to get done as possible. The primary focus of this time together is to build relationships. And that's not to say that everybody should sit around and play Team Fortress for five days. But, you know, when you're trying to figure out what's going on during that time period, try to keep that in mind. Um, and, you know, you want to use it, so you want to like, try to solve problems. And this is also a good time to solve really difficult problems that you know, you really do need that FaceTime, that high bandwidth, face-to-face -face communication to try to solve those problems together. Um, and uh, try to spread knowledge. I uh, highly recommend like an open space format for the whole thing. It just makes it easier. Um, so that's, that's sort of the, the how to do it section. Um, and then sort of there, there are some things, you know, kind of anti-patterns that I want to talk about, like what not to do. Um, and some of it I've kind of mentioned previously, but you know, and you know, be for for one. There's probably sarcasm in my head. Um, so if you want to do it poorly, use only free communication tools. You know, it's it's really important to invest in the development tools that you have, but just you know, avoid spending money on communication tools at all. Obviously, that's a terrible idea. You invest in your development tools. Invest in your communication tools at all. Um, it's amazing how much time and energy can be spent trying to overcome the uh, problems associated with crappy communication tools. Um, like, I highly recommend if you don't have someone that's a specialist on your team, 
then hire a contractor who knows how to do the stuff uh, to set up your polycoms and all that ridiculous stuff. And um, if you're big enough that you have the need for a person, hire a person to do that because um, it's it's so critical. One of the one of the big things is you know you want your team to have a shared vision. You want your team to have a shared understanding of which direction you're going so that you can achieve that thing. Um, but the method by which that is being spread is through your communication tools. And if they have become an impediment to you, like spreading your vision to the employees, then they have become an impediment to you succeeding as an organization. Um, it's so critical. Uh, if you want to do distributed teams poorly, fear over communication. Worry that you're killing people too much. Um, like worry that, you know, well I said this in an email so I'm not going to put it in the chat. Or, you know, I, I said this here, I put it in the blog, but I'm not going to say it anywhere else because I only want to say everything once. Um, this does not work. Um, uh, I have, I have a, a, a quippy phrase that I say a lot, which is highly effective remote teams over communicate. Um, you have to, just to, even, in, even in an office environment, I mean, we all know the telephone game, like, just getting people on board in an office environment, like where everybody's in the same room, is incredibly difficult. And it's the same thing distributed. It takes a lot of sort of, I feel like a, an important part of management is just saying the same thing over and over again to as many different people as possible. Just to try to get that, that message blanketed in, it's everywhere as much as I can, sort of in you know, slightly different ways, so maybe some people understand it in different ways. Just trying to get the vision pushed down. Um, that can be very difficult. Uh, and this goes back to what we talked about earlier, if you want to do probably exclude remote employees, like have the party and just ignore all the remote people because they're second class citizens and we don't really care about them. Um, this also goes to, uh, like if you're having a meeting, you know, if two people are having a meeting and they're talking about something and they know that there's this person that's on the remote side of things that's really interested in this. But, you know, I'd have to open my laptop and click the Skype button to get them here and that's just a lot of work. And, you know, and so there's, and it seems kind of silly, but that friction is very real. You have to make a conscious effort to say, I want to include this person in this conversation because I value them. Um, <clears throat> if you want to make distributed suck, and this works for in office too, actually, have lots of required meetings. Um, I strongly believe that people are only annoyed by meetings when they don't gain any value from them. And if you're not gaining value from a meeting, then you need to like take a step back and think about what you're trying to achieve. Uh, Kate Matsudaira has a great blog article she just posted like a day or two ago on um, you know ways to have effective meetings to make sure that you're actually getting your money's worth out of a meeting. Um, I highly recommend that people sit down over in their meeting and figure out what the burn rate is for just the salaries of the people that are in that meeting right now. Um, I've killed lots of meetings by like getting out my phone and a little math and being like. This meeting is costing us $80 a minute. <laughs> Please stop talking. Because um, you can take a lot of the stuff offline. Most of the time you need a very small set of people to make the right decisions. Um, this is something that Scott will probably disagree with me on. But uh, if you want to do distribute, distributed poorly, dictate communication media. Because nothing says efficiency like everyone using Outlook. Um, it's really important that um, people have the, like communication is so much more important. It's already like super critical, but it's so even more critical for a distributed team. Um, so it's really important that people be willing to use the communication tools they have available. And if there's any friction whatsoever, it's gonna cause problems. Um, the flip side of this, excuse me, carbonated water, kind of a bad idea. Um, the flip side of this is that if you have too many communication tools, you're going to end up with crap everywhere and just not know where anything is. So there's, there's, there's definitely a balance to be had there. Um, you just have to feel that out. Um, but I think the important thing is to let teams explore. Um, let them try to figure it out. Because they're the ones that know what their communication needs are more than anyone else. Um, which ties into the fear of emergent solutions. If you want to do it poorly, fear emergent solutions. Um, I think Agile and Lean sort of tend to, well, it's 
part of them, like a core part of Agile and Lean, is the idea that emergent solutions um, are can be very successful. And I don't know exactly the mechanism of this, but I feel like the distributed team sort of even further encourages such things. I don't know how or why that works, but that's just been sort of my experience. And um, so, you know, you're not going to have big design up front, but you're even more not going to have big design up front if you have a distributed team. Um, so, that's what that is. Uh, only have an inference party. I feel like I've beat that at horse quite a lot. Um, and so, I'm just going to skip to the conclusion. Um, I have just one last slide for the conclusion, um, and I touched on this a little bit earlier, but at the end of the day, if, if this is something that's right for your organization, and it's not right for every organization, please don't interpret what I'm saying that way. Um, it can be very difficult to implement. It's not right for all you know, business domains. It's not, if, if you can get all your people locally and everybody's super happy about it, then get your people locally, because, you know, why not? Um, but the thing is, like, the thing that's going to make this work, or the thing that's going to make this fail, is the people that are involved. Um, if you have, if you're an employee, the thing that's going to make it work for you is having a company, having people at your company that are invested in making a distributed team work. Um, if you're an employer, the thing that's going to make this distributed team super performant and able to deliver on time and you know predictably and all those fun things is if you have the people on the team that are able to sort of deliver those things. Um, it's just, it's the same thing that's going to make your company work if it's co-located or if it's distributed. Um, your, your organization is the people. Um, I can't say that enough. Uh, so that's all I really have. Um, I wanted to thank everyone that uh, helped me prepare this and share, me, share with their experiences with me. Um, I started listing names, but the slide got a little crazy, so I just stopped. Um, but I love what I do, and so if you have any questions about any of this, please feel free to reach out to me on any of the things that are listed up there, uh, or after this. I love talking about this stuff. Um, I'm a little crazy about it, so, you know, it's just better for you, because I'll be happy to talk to you at length about any of the issues that you have going on right now. So, thank you. Are there any questions? So, pair programming. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that work successfully between remote people? I have. Okay. Um, and I think just as pair programming is a learned skill, um, it, doing it remotely is a learned skill as well. Um, at uh, Cheeseburg, go what ahead. What are the differences that, that you would emphasize? Um, you know, gosh, I feel like Bobby or <laughs> Dan or Cameron would be better to answer that than I would. Uh, for me personally, um, it's very different from sitting two people with two keyboards. You tend to do uh, driver and observer a lot more. So someone is, is doing all of the typing, and the other person is kind of thinking through the problem and, and talking to that person. And then you switch regularly. So and you, know, you commit, you push up the repo, the other person pulls down, and then you reverse roles. Do you feel like that's uh, an when I was, ex I experienced the same thing, and I felt like that was sort of a, a lack of, like, I felt like the tooling still wasn't quite there yet yes. to enable true, like, ping pong pairing. Yeah. Um, okay, so, so I was curious what that was. Our, our team typically uses uh, a mixture of Skype and join me, so we'll throw up a join me session, call each other on Skype, and work that way, and join me just doesn't allow, or it yes. doesn't work very well with remote typing. Yeah. Sarah? Um, when we did this at Linen Lab, we would often uh, toss Emacs into a screen session and work attached to it and just code in Emacs, yeah. which doesn't work with my team, obviously. But you can make Emacs do a lot of shit. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, Emacs, you can make Emacs I was do anything. PHP or Python, so yeah. it, it wasn't that bad. I think the C++ guys had more trouble with that. Yeah. We've had a lot of luck with the graphical equivalent, maybe. We use Citrix. So mm. Our guys remote their boxes physically here. They remote in. Citrix and we use Citrix client and it works well. You got to be careful not to inter like the ping pong is really no. very possible. Hmm. That's interesting. I didn't, I didn't actually, I've never used that before in that way. Anybody else? Yes. Do you have any problems with uh, just you wake up one day and you just like, I really don't want to do any work today? 
And if so, how do you get around that? Uh, how do you get around that in the office? <laughs> no. you know, you Mental high, illness. Yeah, it's, it's the same thing. I mean, it's silly to say that like you never have a day like that where you're just like, you know what, I'm just not on my game. I'm just sitting here, like, I've been checking my email for like an hour and a half. <laughs> and I mean, that, that happens, but I feel like that happens in the office as well. Um, I don't know that that problem is unique distributed. I will say, I, I mean, I have that problem you know, not wanting to be out of bed. And because I don't have to drive into Seattle or drive into an office or something, it's not a big deal to sleep in. Yeah. Or go sit on my couch and drink coffee for an hour while watching the Good Morning America or something. Until I do get motivated to go in the office. Yeah. I've always found that um, there have definitely been days where, um, I'm in Cleveland by the way, so I'm three hours ahead of almost every single person I've around. Um, and so there have been a lot of days where I've gotten started and halfway through the day, I've either run out of things to do or I've just run out of steam. And I've been like, all right, I'm going to go hang out with my family, do some stuff, and then come back later yeah. and sink back up with these guys because they're still rocking. Yeah. And so being on a distributed team, even if those guys, even if the rest of the team wasn't online, I can still come back on at night and talk about if I wanted to. Whereas if you were in an office, you can't interrupt with the office. And yeah. There's, there's two things there that I want to touch on. And one, distributed teams tend to favor asynchronous communications a lot more because of exactly that style of interaction. Um, so that's just that's just the thing. Uh, the second thing is that it's Cameron, especially, I don't. You might be able to comment on this, but there there can be situations where you come into the office and if you're on the East Coast, you're three hours ahead of everyone else, and you're just like, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing today. And then sort of like there's this little bit of downtime where you're just like, oh, I guess I'll do whatever I need, you know. Um, but Tim, uh, do you have any insight into? how this might be different, harder, or easier for uh, an environment in a context where you're not agile so much? Um, I'm thinking in terms of project management is often a friction point uh, between local versus remote. Uh, I don't know that I have the experience to really talk to that, um, which is a fancy way of saying I have no idea. <laughs> I know I'm abhorrent because I'm not agile. We all have our sins. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes. Marissa Meyer, is she wrong? Uh, oh, I, you know, I, I was like, oh, this is the perfect time. She did the whole, uh, so I don't know who's, if everybody's familiar, but um, Yahoo just like completely got rid of like remote work there. Um, and I was, I was really tempted to sort of like carve out a piece of my presentation and just sort of talk about Yahoo. I didn't. I, I didn't. Um, I don't know. I think. I don't think she's wrong. Um, I think that every company is a unique sort of environment, and that she has to make the decisions that are um, best suited for what she thinks is going to be moving forward. Um, would I have made the same decision? I don't know. I'm not in her shoes. I don't know all the information that she has. Um, but when you're, you know, when you're the leader of a company that big. Um, a company that honestly is kind of floundering a little bit. You know, there's a lot of pressure to sort of make progress. And so, do I think that getting rid of remote employees is really going to help them make the progress that they need to make? I don't think so. Um, but obviously, she does. And I can't begin to understand the stresses that she's in. So, I don't know if that's a cop out answer or not. But. Anybody else? Oh, go ahead. When you're trying to find people to be remote for you, mm -hmm. uh, what are some qualities you're looking for? Because unless you've worked with them in the past, I can imagine it's really hard to validate them. Well, obviously, you want you know all the all the technical skills that you need, um, but you really need to focus on communication, um, and so you have to learn to sort of. You know, interview for, you know, does this person have communication skills? Not only do they know how to write code, but do they know how to work on a team? Do they know sort of what it means to communicate with people outside the company? Um, one of the things that I like to do in an interview to sort of try to suss that out is I'll ask a person, you know, like in your, in your career, like in your resume, what is one of the, what is your favorite project that you've worked on? And it's like, and it's like, okay, great, blah, blah, blah. And they, it's like, what made that, 
like what did you do to contribute to make that successful? And then you know they talk about you know whatever. Um, the thing that they talk about when you ask what they did to make it successful, um, almost always that should be something to do with how they communicated with someone else. If they talk about the thing that they did to make a project successful was this whiz bang cool feature code thingy that they made, that's a pretty big problem for me actually. Um, because, and this, is, this might just be my bias, um, but the communication aspect of software development is much more difficult than the technical aspect of software development. Making the right thing is more difficult than making a thing. Um, and so when you ask them, you know, what, what were the most difficult aspects of that project? I want to hear about, you know, struggles they had with their stakeholders trying to figure out what they needed. I want to hear about, you know, trying to understand what the business was trying to achieve. Um, so from that perspective, like, I want the best parts and the worst parts of a project when I'm interviewing someone to be about their team, about the communication, about the business. Um, so, GitHub is turned into kind of a portfolio tool. So, you know, if you want to hire someone, you go and you expect them to have a GitHub profile and see contributions yeah. to their projects. Is there an equivalent in uh, the, in some way that you can measure communication? I mean, would you see correlation to someone being really active on Twitter or something like that? You know, it's kind of interesting, but I would say that GitHub itself is a pretty strong correlation to having communication skills because it's kind of a social coding platform in a way. Um, Twitter blogs obviously are really sort of good indicators that they're interested in you know, communicating with other humans. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Any sort of involvement they have in local development groups, such as this one, is a huge positive indicator um, that you know, the person is interested in you know, being a social creature. Um, but there's not like a, I wouldn't like look at their LinkedIn and be like, oh, we love that. <laughs> um, okay. I'd say one, in, one indication that we've used is how many questions do they ask in the interview? Yeah. That's always a big one. Just how much do they engage with you in an interview is a huge thing. You know, they just sit there and answer your questions. If they don't, you know, like I, I want an interview. I want someone to like drag me over the coals in an interview. Like, why did you do this? This is terrible. I mean, not like being like bad about it. I mean, obviously, you don't want like you know, incredibly rude people. But you know, I want, I want people to feel comfortable challenging me. All right. Well, if you do have any more questions, um, there's my ridiculously long email address, and um, I appreciate everybody's time tonight, and thank you for letting me come and talk to you.